and will be uploaded on the web in an accessible format at some point after the session. Details will be provided on the School of Education website. Cameras will be turned off and microphones muted to aid privacy and also for bandwidth reasons. Please use the chat facility to introduce yourself to fellow participants, but please do not include personal information such as phone numbers or emails. Please use the Q&A facility to ask questions. These will be collated and responses will be provided in the Q&A session with both presenters and panellists responding. Now, I'd like to introduce Professor Ellen Boren, who will chair this session. Okay, um, thank you, Muir. So, um, welcome everyone to this, um, as we already said, third webinar um, within the School of Education. And today we're going to indeed uh, focus on adult learning and, and youth transitions, which is, of course, an important um, theme running throughout um, the School of Education at the University of Glasgow um, traditionally. So, um, quite a lot of the presenters today are part of our Cradle Centre. Um, so I definitely recommend um, that people have a look at the Cradle website as well. It's just cradle.org and um, that you have like a good listen and discuss the projects um, that we're cur currently running or projects that have recently um, been finished by, um, by colleagues. So we're indeed going to listen to uh, three separate presentations and um, one of them, the one uh, we're going to start with is by Professor Catherine Lido, who is going to talk about um, the FISNET project. So that is virtual in situ networking to reinvent the rules of international collaboration and reduce gender differences in academic um, careers, which is basically an ESR ESPRC funded project. So Catherine first, then we're going to move on to my colleagues um, Srabani Maitra and Judith Yakovkis. And they are going to talk about a GCRF funded projects on uh, dual apprenticeships. And they are going to ask, you know, ourselves the question, can dual apprenticeships create better and more equitable social and economic outcomes for young people? So that will be the second presentation for today. And then um, finally, we move on to uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Oscar Valiente, who is not yet with us, but um, who, will, who will pop up soon. And he's going to talk us through um, some results of the Young Adult Project, which was um, an Horizon 2020 project that has recently finished. So he's going to talk about policy supporting young people in their life course, a comparative perspective of lifelong learning and inclusion in education and work in Europe. So we're going to have three time slots of 10 minutes. Um, in the meantime, if people want to ask questions and so on, that's fine. Uh, we have my colleague Sergio here with here who is going to collate your questions. But before we're going to um, go into, into a Q&A session after the presentations, we're first going to um, give the floor to two um, panelists who I will introduce to you after we've listened to the three presentations. So um, welcome again everyone and I suggest we're now moving on to um, my colleague Catherine. So Catherine if you can kind of share your screen and um, get started with your presentation. Ten minutes please. Thank you. Unmute. Hello. Thank you so much Ellen. Uh, that was a mouthful, but you're quite right. I'm here to talk about our VisNet project, which is virtual in situ networking to support the careers of, um, of early career women in engineering, in academic engineering. So in particular today, I'm talking about the role of online networking and collaboration and what it can do to help close the gender gap in academic STEM. So I know some people will be talking about youth and transitions. We're sort of looking at the postgraduate into early employment transition and what we can do in terms of addressing inequalities. This is a massive team. So I'd like to thank Carla Subula who drafted uh, these slides. He was our uh, postdoc researcher who has since moved on to the Roundtree Foundation. But here's a picture of the team also co-leads Caroline goshot lindsay in the School of Engineering here, and Helen Mulvana in, um, in the, uh, now in engineering at Strathclyde. Uh, Jill Morrison, not pictured, who's our new PI, but Ann Anderson was the original PI. 
So just having a look at why we got started, the image there that you see is the grade of academic staff and engineering here at Glasgow um, by grade. And you can see obviously that the more senior grades take up less fill on our lovely lady image there, which basically shows that not unlike other trends in wider uh, academic STEM reported by Times Higher, uh, it is disproportionately uh, male professors, um, regardless of how many women there are. And if you look at that small image on the right, I think, of your screen, you can see that actually it really isn't about the number of women even in the area of subject uh, area. So if you look at nursing there on the far right, you can see that even though it's largely male dominated, it has the same issue with the proportion of female professors. And so we started thinking about what might be at the heart but all of the problem, but also the solution. And that for us was collaboration um, because collaborations lead to you know, international networking, which lead to better funding, which lead to more publications, which lead to citing each other, which lead to for further funding, which ultimately we know is what ideally gets you promoted in academia. Although we like the shift to more citizenship collegiality, we know that funding and publications matter in terms of getting ahead in academic STEM. So we tried to come up with some e-interventions or online interventions to try and rival this notion of, a, of an old boys network. So this happened before COVID. We kicked off in uh, 2018. Uh, with the idea of having peer mentoring, but also we were the first in the university to use Microsoft Teams. We actually had the Teams people come out and give us a talk and try and convince us that it was a good tool to use. So I think that might have even been pre-2018. So, um, But we did a whole range of other interventions, and I don't want to talk too much about all of them now. Happy to answer questions later. But we certainly trained it around bespoke training in terms of building an online profile, building your social media following, how to attend conferences virtually. See, all of this is pre-COVID, which is, is quite hilarious, really, if you think about it. When I first said that you could attend a conference virtually without actually being there, sort of stalk a conference, people didn't believe me. Um, and so here we are now. Uh, we all have to attend virtually. But we also had a face-to-face -face event at the Women's Library, and we had lots of things around mapping and auditing your network, um, having goals around building your network and funding people with activities to build their international networks in particular. This was engineering, uh, but also uh, more widely uh, computing science and technology. So it's, it's sort of a broad range. We had a small cohort of 34 early career women in engineering and technology um, who we followed up through three time points, um, which has ended up being um, 2019 to the present. And we're still engaging. June 2019 was our first uh, interviews with the cohort um, who had to apply. It was very um, competitive. And so we've been engaging with them now uh, for a number of years in terms of doing motivational interviews, survey work, having them map their professional and personal networks and watching them grow over time as well as their digital footprint. So that's a little bit about the data and the strategy behind this. It's very much mixed methods. And again, we've, we have a few publications out there and I'm very happy to signpost them um, if you want to read more, but some very early findings that came out right from the very first uh, motivational interviews was the level of barriers that are overtly perceived, but many of which are not overtly acknowledged. So some of the barriers uh, that, that our cohort of women acknowledged was low confidence, particularly when trying to connect with more senior academic staff. And so we got thinking about this notion of imposter, uh, what's called imposter syndrome or called in our field, imposter phenomenon. 
but also real barriers to the potential to travel to make these international links if you have children or if you have health conditions or if you don't have a secure contract that provides you with enough money to do these things on your own time. And a lot of work-life balance issues in terms of making time for things that, that were seen as superfluous. Networking was not seen as important. And so it was taking time away from the lab, but also lots of hidden barriers in terms of um, really not grasping the nature of networking, uh, the risks of being siloed into a subject area, the risks of really valuing hierarchy, um, and undervaluing engagement with people who are on your own professional um, scale. There was a lot of cognitive dissonance too that came out quite unexpectedly in the survey, but more importantly in the interviews, we heard a lot of very overt experiences of sexual harassment. For instance, at um, academic conferences, unwanted touching when you were presenting your poster, people rubbing up against you and touching you inappropriately. And some were firsthand, some were secondhand, some were in the lab, but a lot of them surrounded inappropriate things that happen at conferences. And yet, almost to whole, most of the cohort felt that harassment wasn't an issue um, in, in, in their careers and in getting ahead. And yet they're reporting some really quite shocking stuff. Now, since then, the documentary picture uh, of a scientist has come out. And so we are having these conversations more overtly, but I think we have a very long way to go, not just in the hidden um, barriers, but in very explicit sexual harassment that is going unacknowledged. That's another talk though, perhaps. So here's just some of the findings around the networks that they mapped. So they physically mapped these networks. We put them into an app-based um, sort of beautiful matrix I'll show you in a minute. And we revisited them over two time points and I'll show you them at the end. But some of the initial uh, findings were that their networks were increasing as they went through the Viznet um, interventions, if you like, or support. The density of them was also decreasing, which meant they were more widely dispersed, which is also a good thing. So there was less subject siloing as a result of engaging in this. And also, there was this tendency to network up and so and to want to build the networks up, which we found interesting. So we can't say if that's a good or a bad thing. There was increased use of digital tools um, and increased self-confidence in themselves, but also uh, in, in using these online tools, which were very new at the time and clearly have advantaged our cohort when COVID hit. So there's just also some specific digital tool usage um, from time one to time two. We obviously need to fill this in for time three, but you would think that it's probably hopefully on the same trajectory. And you can see that they're using things like LinkedIn and ResearchGate a lot in engineering and technology. Twitter was relatively less used at the start. And, and I think at time three, that'll be even higher. Right, so here's our beautiful, I hope you can see this. I'm not sure if my picture is in the middle or your picture is in the middle, but these are the longitudinal ego networks at different time points. And so you can see, this is just um, the average for the, for the cohort in, in how they, but you could look, we brought the networks map to each individual person so they could look at their own network and how it was changing and how it was shifting and circle, you know, points they wanted to grow, points they wanted to connect. And so we found a, a few potholes or pitfalls in terms of over-reliance on your manager, or sometimes your lab leads networks rather than building your own, which is a problem if you are on a precarious contract and you might need to leave that lab. At two, clustering very strongly based around people within your own lab, which again is a problem if you come to the end of your project funding and you need to shift labs. And C, having a lot of unconnected individuals, so sort of just a random network rather than a strategic network. So I realize that time is running short. Um, so I'll just very quickly um, talk about some of the implications of what we're learning from this. We are replicating other work that finds that women tend to have um, the same amount of collaborations, but they tend to be more local. Um, and so in terms of broadening them and making them more international, we can see that that really is 
going to help address the um, at least career progression attainment gap. We don't like to, um, oh, this was Carla's point. We don't like to think of ourselves as super unique, but, um, sorry, we all like to think we're super unique, but we found that our cohort was having some similar issues um, in terms of ruling out people based on seniority, really um, not realizing that the Viznet cohort uh, members themselves are going to be a valuable network in future. So these 30, 34, women are creating bonds that are going to help their careers in future, but they weren't sort of realizing that. Hopefully they do now, or they will when they watch this video back. And also valuing academic over support staff, not realizing the role that making different forms of, you know, social capital building is useful for your career, and likewise engaging outside their fields which brought us to our face-to-face -face collaborative event um, at the Women's Library where everybody invited one stakeholder. I think I'm coming to the end. And what they found was they engaged not with just their invited guest, but with the other guests too. So um, just to wrap up, we've presented this back to our cohort, but also Glasgow School of Engineering. I should say the other universities are Strathclyde and Edinburgh. So um, Edinburgh, we have Katie here, can talk a little bit more about what eBase have done in terms of trying to bring these findings out and just really help people think more strategically about how they can invest in their networks and grow um, their physical, but also digital presence. This is our industrial partners. You can see that we've worked with a lot of uh, industrial partners as well, who've helped invest in our training, but also with our dissemination. So these are the references. If you want to know more, you can follow us on Twitter at Viznet underscore, um, and we'd love to hear more from you. Thanks. All right, thank you very much, Katrin, for a very interesting um, presentation. So as I said before, we're gonna leave the comments from the panelists and the Q&A um, until we finished all three presentations. So. Um, we now basically move on to Srabani and Judith to talk about the dual apprenticeship. So Srabani and or um, Judith, if you can share your screen and then get started. Um, so you get basically 10 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, I will share. Can you all see? Uh, I hope. Great. So uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ellen, Mike and Muir for inviting us to share this project with everyone and a very warm welcome to all of you who have joined uh, this afternoon. Judith and I, we are going to talk about our current ESRC funded project on dual apprenticeship in India and Mexico. The project is uh, led by Dr. Oscar Valiente from the School of Education and Oscar's here as well, uh, but we'll be talking about a different project of his. We also have a very international and interdisciplinary research team with uh, co-investigators from the Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta, um, Technological Institute of Monterrey, Mexico, University of Zurich, University of Cologne, and we also have a very international advisory team of experts from around the world, both academic and non-academic. So from such institutions such as the UNESCO Univoc, uh, Skills Development Scotland, Austrian Foundation for Development Research, uh, also in individual countries in India and Mexico, we have uh, a number of non-academic partners as well, and one of them, Bengal Chamber of Commerce, uh, uh, is uh, one of the one of our partners from Bengal Chamber of Commerce in India is with us here as well. So, what is our project about? Um, in this project, um, our aim is to understand why and how lower and middle income countries like India and Mexico decide to adopt dual apprenticeship, the German model of dual apprenticeship. Now, as many of you perhaps know that the, that the dual apprenticeship is a particular model uh, from Germany, where there's a very close collaboration between school-based education and workplace training. 
What is particularly significant about this model is uh, A, the high involvement of employers in training and decision making, and also the very close and strong coordination that exists between social partners and the state in the governance of the training system. Um, the, the, the model really um, is quite uh, quite demanding in the in the occupational standards and student students uh, enrolled in the program go through a rigorous process of training both in schools uh, as well as in the workplace um, to uh, acquire a formal qualification. Now, this particular Germanic model of dual apprenticeship has attracted global attention for several reasons. A, because of the positive effect it has had on student learning, learning about their work, work aligned to the labor market. Also, the model apparently has um, helped, especially in the global north, a, a number of young people to enter the labor market, uh, to get integrated into the labor market. And finally, the graduates of dual apprenticeship, have, uh, apprenticeship program have been uh, able to contribute immensely to the productivity of companies in, in many countries like um, Austria and Switzerland. Now, our focus uh, on dual apprenticeship in the global south is particularly important because it is, um, it is important to keep in mind that uh, uh, transfer of policy from the global north to the global south involves a complex process and it may not always produce the expected results. Therefore, by focusing on the adoption and the implementation processes of this particular Germanic model in the Global South, our research uh, contributes to the understanding of several gaps that exist in the literature. Now, what are some of these gaps? Broadly, in the area of technical and vocational education, there is lack of academic studies about the role of vocational education in Elmic countries. For example, our focus, therefore, is on India and Mexico. And even when there are studies, most of them offer a very decontextualized analysis of skill formation. And then again, if we looked at slightly narrowly into the field of dual apprenticeship and the policy adoption of dual apprenticeship, we see that there are several gaps as well. For example, there is lack of evidence of dual transferability from the global north to the global south. There's lack of studies uh, focusing on whether the, the, the same policy can be copied exactly uh, into a different uh, cultural, economic or social context or not. Um, some of the st studies that exist are very much from the donor country's perspective, that is from the perspective of the global north. And most importantly, uh, our focus on young people, their voices and their understanding of the background uh, that they are coming from and what impact this particular policy has on their background, especially if they're coming from marginalized backgrounds, is important because we have noted that in the literature there is a systematic omission of the impact of this apprenticeship of this particular model on young apprentices and on what happens to the kind of social inequalities that they experience. Therefore, there are several areas where our study makes an important contribution. I'm going to now hand over to Judith to talk about the outcomes of the project. Thank you, Zavani. So yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, we have different outcomes planned. Uh, the project is not finished yet, so we have designed different uh, strategies or uh, designed different channels to reach different groups of audiences or beneficiaries that we expect could take advantage of the results of this project. We have defined three broad groups of um, beneficiaries. You can see in the slide, like, the first group will be policymakers, but also academics. And we are um, preparing different materials in different formats, like research summaries or policy briefs, um, as well as, of course, journal articles, book chapters, and so on. But we are also um, planning and developing now online meetings. We started with face-to-face uh, -face meetings, of course, at the national level and also with our national, uh, international advisory board. Um, the second group uh, are students, teachers, trainers, and employers um, involved in different, um, 
in different examples of dual apprenticeship that is conducted in Mexico, in India, and um, hopefully also in other countries that can use the results of this research in their own um, benefit. We are disseminating these uh, results through our website, the website of the project, and uh, also trying to foster different project dissemination meetings now uh, online. Um, we are working in this aspect because um, the, the, the working package or the part of the project addressing this particular um, target group is, is developing now. So we are not yet at this point, but this is one of our main interests to, to be able to reach this group of beneficiaries. And the last group will be the early career researchers. In each of the teams participating in the project, we have early career researchers, um, pre-docs and very first stage postdocs. So we um, designed for them different tailored uh, workshops and uh, trainings for them in terms of methodology or theoretical approaches to the to the field and also we boost their participation in co-authored uh, papers so they can like engage in all the parts in all the process of, of, of the research from the very beginning in the design uh, to the end to the production of, of um, papers. And then if we go to the expected impacts, um, thanks Ravani. We think we can highlight three very broad impacts. Uh, as, uh, as Ravani was telling you, um, the success of the development of dual apprenticeships depends on many, many factors in, in different contexts. And uh, the attraction that the, dual, the Germanic dual apprenticeship model has captured is very related to the success it has uh, generated in its own context. And we want to raise some critical aspects when you try to implement these kind of policies in other contexts that can make the difference um, in, the, in the success of the, of the initiative. So uh, first, we have seen that the mismatch between uh, skills uh, required by the companies and the skills provided by schools is very, very present in policymaker discourses and so on. Um, but I, we think that the project gives some space to the conversation at the national level between the different actors participating in the design and in the implementation of these policies that can not only help to raise this awareness on the lack of alignment, but also to work towards a better alignment, not only that schools uh, satisfying directly the needs of the companies, but also the companies adapting some of their practices to the needs of the students. Um, this links to the second uh, big impact we expect to have uh, related to the rise of awareness on the need to, to promote and to provide better opportunities in the labor market for marginalized youth. And uh, we think that the dual apprenticeships could be a nice strategy to, to reach this goal, but not, uh, not uh, when it is developed uh, without this awareness of the need of, uh, of the characteristics of the people uh, who is uh, attending this kind of training and the needs of the labor market in which they are willing to, to, to uh, insert. And finally, um, one of the key issues that explains the success of the dual model in Germany and in Germanic countries is the high involvement of employers in the in the all development of the of the policy and this is something that we think we can um, we can contribute in the countries we are working with um, in terms of rice the awareness of the relevance of their involvement in the implementation of the of the policies we think they need to be 
uh, as promoters, as beneficiaries of this policy. Um, otherwise, um, the, the policies don't have the, all the legs they need to have in order to succeed. And uh, finally, we want just to add some uh, remarks of uh, some participants in, in some partners in our project in India and in Mexico. The first quotation is from a policymaker in India and uh, the second one for a participant in a project dissemination meeting in Mexico. And we think that both uh, like highlight this uh, interest that the project uh, has uh, uh, captured from many different actors that see like an opportunity of having a table in which everybody can sit and discuss how to address uh, these kind of policies. Um, and here there is also the website if you want to take a look. We try to, uh, we, we always try to keep it uh, updated. Um, I think that's all. I'm not sure if I have uh, extended too much my my uh, exposition. Thank you. Thank you. Judith. Okay, thank you very much, um, Judith and uh, Strapani. So that was, a, you know, again, a very interesting um, presentation. So we now move on to our last presentation of the day, which is about the Young Adults Project. And Oscar Valiente, my colleague, is going to um, talk us through. So Oscar, if you can start sharing your screens and, and we also give you 10, 10 minutes um, to go through your presentation. Uh, thank you, Ellen. I'm here battling with the, with the Zoom. Um, is there any possibility that you, um, you share the presentation? Um, because I, I just... Uh, um, Hold on, Oscar, I should be able to do it. Oh, thank you, Mia. You're getting it up here? Yeah, okay. Right. Brilliant. <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, uh, thanks to everyone for, for attending today and, and to Muir, uh, uh, Mike and, and Ellen for organizing this. Um, this is a project that is already finished. Um, um, it, it, it was run from 2016 to 2019. Um, it was a Horizon 2020 project. So um, these are projects funded by the European Commission. They publish a call on specific topics that they are interested in. And um, European consortiums, we are partners from across Europe. We, we develop bids together and, and we apply for this. And, and, and this particular call was about um, lifelong learning and, and young people. Uh, um, uh, and, and many, many colleagues were involved in this project. Uh, I, I should start with uh, mentioning Keral Capsada. Um, she, she was the postdoctoral researcher in the project. She started still as a, when she was uh, a PhD uh, with Viva pending and, and today is a lecturer in our university. We, we, we love to think that this is probably the, the most important achievement of the project, but obviously it's us getting credit for something that she, she achieved by herself. Uh, she cannot be here today because she's uh, the external examiner in Abaiba in, 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 in the continent uh, right now. So um, she sends her apologies, but there are many other colleagues involved in the, that were involved in the project. Michelle Sveisford, you know her, Kristen Hermanson, Kevin Lowden, Leslie Doyle, Ellen van der Hoven, uh, Angela Bravo. Um, I think I have seen Ellen and Angela in the list of attendees today. So hello, you can uh, pop in and compliment and, uh, uh, whenever it, uh, you want. Um, and also Patricia Wallace. Uh, Patricia was the project manager, so uh, administrative support 
to the project. So, someone, sometimes they are not um, given credit, but she helped us a lot to, to in, in this project. And Judith obviously was also part of the project from uh, another partner in Spain. So, and she also knows about this. Um, so here is important to understand the timing of the project. Thank you. Um, that the, the interest of the European Commission in, in, in young adults and, and, and lifelong learners, because in, uh, by that time we were uh, struggling with the direct consequences of a, of a global crisis. And when we say global crisis, we all uh, are familiar with this because we are living one now. Uh, it was a different kind of global crisis. It was the global financial crisis that had a huge impact in, in youth uh, employment. And um, these concerns of how to manage the post-recession process and how to support this, um, young people in their access to employment was the, the, the main aim of this call. Um, what we did in our project is we had like three entry points to the issue. We, we look at the policies that countries were adopting to, to, to respond to these challenges, but also we wanted to know how these policies were enacted on the ground by people that were working in different local settings with young people. And obviously we wanted to talk to these young, young people, the beneficiaries of, of the policies. Um, we can move to the, to the, to the next slide. Um, yeah, that was a comparative study. And sometimes comparative studies are a bit messy. Uh, in this case, we were comparing nine different countries, but not only nine different countries, 18 regions across Europe, two regions per country, and uh, three policies by, uh, per region. So it was, a, a, I think in total we had 64 policies that we were comparing in this, in this project, and we had 14 teams across Europe involved. So um, that, that um, might look uh, like um, obviously interesting in terms of comparisons and the uh, different contexts, not only between countries, but within countries. But also it was a, a, a huge coordination effort. And, and you learn a lot by collaborating with colleagues in other um, um, countries about how they do things, how they, their disciplinary approaches, the institutional cultures. Um, Catherine was talking in the first presentation today about um, early career researchers and gender issues. Well, th this is a big thing in universities. And, and in a project like this, you could see how this was differently managed across different institutions in different countries. And I think was, was, that was one of the most important elements that we had to um, um, constantly negotiate in this in in this collaboration international collaborations but yeah it's it's these are great opportunities for for learning not only about what happens in other countries but how other researchers in other places um, 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 uh, try to produce some um, valid knowledge on these issues uh, and I hope that in the future we will continue doing this um yeah if we can move to the next slide um Someone told me once that if, if you want to communicate, never go with a list that is more than seven points. Uh, so yeah, we decided to go with seven main findings. Um, the, and, and these findings, are um, they come from the comparative. So they are common trends, but obviously there are variations. And some of them are more relevant for the Scottish context. Others might be uh, less. Um, I will try to use examples uh, from a scholar from abroad. Um, the first one is that <clears throat> the lifelong learning policies that we saw in this um, specific moment of time um, really focus on, on employment and young people. So um, young people emerge as a target group for policies, for social policies, but also for, for education policies as a problematic group by, by itself. And, and when this emerge, this double shift, not only towards young people, but also to skills for work in terms of wider aims of, of lifelong learning, um, um, came in parallel and at the same time. And I remember that a few years ago in 2019, when the project was 
finishing, I had a conversation with a government official here in Scotland. And I asked if, if youth unemployment uh, data was really going down and circumstances in, improving, if they were going to go back to, to the original lifelong or more broader aims of, of, of these policies. And his answer was very clear is, yes, we are going back to the adult population as a whole, not just the young people, but forget about lifelong learning. All will be about the skills here in Scotland. So there are things that are just for a moment of time, but there are other things that stay in these changes. Um, the second element that we found is the lack of ambition of many of these policies. They target young people in, in difficult circumstances, but they individualize social pro, uh, problems like uh, economic crisis. So they think that individuals should find their own way to, to, to deal with their individual circumstances without any structural change being um, uh, pursued by this policy. So this lack of ambition is something that probably now we are learning from the previous management of the crisis, the crisis in, uh, that started in 2008, that in the new crisis, the discussions are, are much uh, broader and some structural uh, changes need to be adopted today to deal with the current crisis. Uh, and we have seen an example of the recent uh, budget approved by the European Commission uh, supporting the recovery of member countries. We never saw that uh, as an initial response to the previous crisis. The overlaps of contradiction and contradictions between lifelong learning policies between different areas of government, but also between different levels of government. It's amazing how these logics of public policy uh, and the hierarchies within the state uh, affect the ability of people in, lo in localities to collaborate with each other and to provide solutions to, to young people. Um, when we say that these policies are for these populations, uh, what sometimes we forget that these policies also serve a purpose within the government departments that are difficult to, to and, and they get priority sometimes over the needs of beneficiaries. <coughs> Fourth point, the question of employers' engagement. Basically, the private sector is not helping or was not helping by then. We have seen in this country, in the UK, we are already a country that invests very, where employers invest very little in the training of young people, in, their, in the training of their workers, and the pattern is declining. So doing policy uh, with employers is becoming more and more difficult. Uh, and sometimes it's because there are not institutional incentives, and sometimes it's because they just don't want, and the, and the culture of, of, of employer is that why shall I be paying for something that students uh, or young people benefit themselves and I don't get an, a direct uh, uh, benefit? So another element, the fifth point is the when they evaluate, uh, these policies are much more concerned about monitoring through data than listening to the beneficiaries. It's amazing how, how rich are the interviews with young people, how much they can tell you about what works and what doesn't work in policies. But this is not the kind of evidence that policymakers want. So if you step up in a room in Scotland uh, trying to convince a, a policymaker about something, they will not listen to you if you, not, if you don't start the conversation by showing some statistics, what is interesting. Um, the, the point number six, um, nobody seems to be interested in evaluating in this policy. Um, and, and there might be very different reasons for that. Uh, but one of them probably is related to the fact that this funding is not um, a hard funding. It's, it's funding that appears in public budgets as a result of initiatives from Europe, European Social Fund, so on, emergency funds to deal with problems. But people don't, these are not considered issues as, soci, uh, as uh, social rights, like lifelong learning has never been enacted as a social uh, right and in, 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 in even in europe so the people that managing these funds they always try to protect them and evaluating them is putting them at risk um, in some way for them so uh, here there is something that should be done in order to foster a culture of, of, of evaluation and finally the last point 
is um, this tension that we see about the uh, individualization of, of, of forms of disadvantage among young people, that intersection of uh, uh, gender, social class, uh, health issues. Health was a big problem already before the pandemic for young people. And the difficulty of, of designing a standard solution for very diverse situations. And this is not a thing that can be easily fixed because policy will always try to standardize the solutions and, and, and the problematic is becoming more and more diverse. So that will be the, the, the seven ideas we wanted to share with you today. Um, and there is still a couple of slides just uh, about uh, publications that emerge from, from the project. These are peer-reviewed articles. There is a section in the Young Adult website that you can check publications also from people that are not based in the University of Glasgow. And the, and the next one is, uh, is about the books. Uh, we have one book out that was published in 2019, I guess, um, and, and another book that is coming this year. So yeah, it's plenty of material out there to, to read for those that are interested. Thank you, guys. Okay, thank you very much, um, Oscar, for your presentation. Now, um, as I said at the beginning of the web webinar, we're now going to give the floor to two panelists. Um, they both have um, a connection with two of the presentations that we've been listening today. And um, first of all, um, I'm going to give the floor to um, Katie Baines, who is a project manager of Evidence Base, which is um, a research group established to promote and execute system-based approaches to um, address problems of equality, diversity, and inclusion in, in STEM. So um, Katie has a, a PhD in human genetics with expertise in large data analysis, and she now specializes in um, researcher developments with a particular emphasis on addressing systemic barriers for career progression for marginalized researchers. So um, after we've listened to Katie, we're going to move on to Soma Mitra Mukherjee, who is the Deputy Director and Head of Research of the Bengal Cham uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And Soma is a very experienced um, researcher in the area of skills, um, socioeconomic characteristics um, and so on. And she has extensively worked with, um, for example, Department of Skills Development, governments in, in West Bengal um, and so on. Um, but she also has expertise as a policy advocate and uh, she has um, very strong networks with um, senior policymakers in, in India. And she has also worked extensively as um, a journalist for prestigious national and international um, media outlets. So um, I give the floor to Katie first, a couple of minutes, if you can kind of come up with your reflections on what you've heard today, and then we move on to Soma. So Katie, the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ellen, um, and thank you to all of the speakers uh, today. It was really interesting to watch and follow your presentations. Um, I'm gonna comment most specifically on Catherine's presentation. Um, because our project Evidence Base is also funded by the same call, um, Inclusion Matters from EPSRC that BizNet is funded on. Um, and I thought it would, today would be an, a, a nice opportunity to, to, to showcase how our projects have worked together, um, which is kind of a consequence um, of the network that has, has come about from Inclusion Matters. Um, and so Catherine's reflections on the importance of networks through BizNet has, was, was really quite poignant. Um, and we, a, a great example of how productive these networks have been for us, um, has, she's mentioned, Catherine's mentioned a, a nature piece and a, um, a longer uh, paper that we worked on together that came out of discussions that started in March last year. So um, one of the co-investigators on our project, Dr. Sarah Shinton, who is the head of research and development at the University of Edinburgh, is also on the advisory board for Biznet. And when the pandemic hit, um, she, she'd started having these conversations with Catherine and other co-eyes on the Biznet project about the impact of COVID and the potentials that could be coming from this, that it, um, actually this crisis could represent an opportunity rather than a disaster in many ways. 
Um, and Sara pulled me in, get being completely overburdened herself. Um, and this was kind of like an example of my network to Sara as an extension then into the network of Viznet. And then we brought in more co-eyes from our team and started to work together on this piece to really explore the opportunities presented by the crisis of COVID um, and to try and offset or at least make recommendations to prevent the crisis being used as an excuse to prevent progress. Um, because something that we can often see um, historically is that crises are often used as excuses to not do the good work that we've been trying to do for a long period of time. You know, we focus on the, the, the bare minimum possible, but actually crises can also drive change. Um, and we we saw the opportunity of, of, of rapid response calls to funding bids as being a really prime opportunity to increase diversity because there weren't the same um, um, infrastructure around having to make applications to research funding. So our project is specifically focused on barriers to, to access accessing funding. And many of our findings overlap with uh, the findings of BizNet in, in showing how important networks and access to opportunities are. Um, and these are often stymied by, you know, dates of funding calls ending when they also coincide with, you know, schools opening again or things like that, school holidays, all these sorts of things that can, can prevent people from accessing these opportunities. Um, so I really uh, recommend reading the piece that Catherine has put in the chat. Um, happy to talk a bit more about um, those specific areas. Um, but yeah, so please check out our project. Um, I'll put links to Evidence Base and, and our Twitter as well. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's most of my reflections. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much for that, um, Katie. Um, we now then move on to Soma. So Soma, if you can get back on the, on the video and um, get your microphone on, then we can start listening to you. Hello, Ellen. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just sharing my screen. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I'm not. So I'm not uh, like. As you know, so, so much. Hello, is this visible now? Yes, we, we can we can see your slides. That's fine. Yeah. So I am I know, my video is off because of connectivity issue. So actually, we are uh, working. We I mean we are getting inputs from Shabani Moitra's work, and we are also part of that. And you know, like uh, if you focus on India, like currently India's government uh, focus is on uh, self-reliance in the manufacturing sector. That is the focus of the government. Uh, so as far as that is concerned for self-reliance in manufacturing sector, you know, they have launched, I mean, the government has launched certain policies rather schemes like Make in India, Startup India, Skill India, right? So towards achieving this manufacturing excellence, uh, skill is very important uh, for India. And you know, for during our this project, primary stakeholders interaction, uh, what we understood as a chamber of commerce that there lies a massive, you know, demand for skilled resources uh, for self reliance in the manufacturing sector. So the convergence between the academia and industry is very crucial. Yes, India has launched it has access in DST, the program which uh, Shabuni has mentioned, that is very crucial for achieving uh, excellence in manufacturing sector, but uh, because it provides necessary framework uh, for in, to supply the industry's demand. And you know, we realize the particular gap is in between the academy, academia and the industry, which is very crucial and which DST can address. And you know, like uh, it is important for the Bengal Chamber of Commerce because it works as a policy advocate. Once this, you know, uh, recommendations from these studies come out, 
they can be suggested to uh, the government and which can be implemented for you know uh, for actually executing dst throughout all the states in india and then only this excellence in manufacturing rather self reliance in manufacturing uh, will be achieved so we understand in a country like india especially considering its current policy the government policy this is very uh, important and we are really really looking forward being a chamber of commerce we are really looking forward to the recommendations that the study provides thank you okay thank you very much um soma so um we've now basically had uh you know like the reflections of the panelists so it's now um time to move on to a couple of questions that have been asked by the audience and um i'm basically gonna start by asking a question to katrin okay so katrin can you please explain a bit more about the role of peer mentoring, not just in terms of collaboration, but maybe also another area like learning or research, for example? Thanks, Ellen, um, and thanks for the question. Um, it's really a great question, and we're hoping to have a separate paper on mentoring. It was started off um, as face-to-face, -face, but we created these little teams mentor groups. And it's been kind of an interesting one because we sort of thought it was a big old failure because time two came and over half the sample said the mentoring wasn't useful to them at all. Um, and we were very down about it. And then we started to look at their network maps and we realized, first of all, they were forgetting to put people in their networks like us, like, like the mentors um, and also the fellow mentees. And so, it wasn't so much that they weren't developing these meaningful links. It's just that because they were more personally supportive, they didn't see the link between the personal and the professional. And so that is something that I think we need to work on. If you're looking at using peer mentoring in terms of, um, let's say, higher education transitions, I think they're super useful, but I think people need to know why they're doing them. And sometimes they can't see that pastoral support and transitional support and well-being support does actually lead to achievement, um, but that link is not always clear. And so that's why I think mentor peer mentoring is so variable. Um, there needs to be very clear expectations about what it is and what it does and what to expect from it, but also where to see the value in it. So I, I hope that helps. I know there's lots of other um, reviews out there of mentoring, but they're all very, um, iffy and i think that's why i think the evaluations are are sometimes focused on you know achievement or promotion or and that's not always where the gains are, are often these more implicit barriers overcoming them yeah okay thank you for your answer to that question catherine i'm, I'm now going to move on to a question for srabani um someone in the q a srabani asked um, I wonder whether the study focused on specific populations in Mexico and India, like urban, very urban citizens, and where is actually the voice of the indigenous people, if there is any? Can you say something about that, Srabani? Sure. Um, that, I think that's a great question. And uh, probably if we, if we had spoken a little bit about the methodology, this would have been clearer in the presentation. But um, I can start by saying about India and then uh, Mexico as well, and then Judith can jump in to add more. Um, in, in both the countries, our the young people that we are interviewing are those from vocational education institutions. And in India and Mexico, in both countries, students who enter vocational education typically come from very marginalized backgrounds. So for example, in India, most of the students that we have, in, we have been interviewing, the project is currently going on, uh, going on um, they are from very, very marginalized backgrounds. So really from very, 
uh, you know, lower cl class, not only class, but caste as well. And there's a lot of pro issues around that also. Um, there's issues around, there are, you know, more young men than women. So gender definitely is an issue and we are trying to incorporate as many women as possible in, in our interviewees, but not many are enrolled in dual apprenticeship programs. So that is a challenge. Uh, in Mexico also, uh, young people come from marginalized backgrounds and there are students uh, from indigenous uh, communities who are enrolled. But um, as far as we have uh, you know, found out so far through our ongoing interviews, interviews that indi in indigenous population do not have a high representation even in vocational education. Judith, um, I think that's something maybe you can speak to a little bit more, but um, it, it's the same with in India. So there's a lot of young people from marginalized backgrounds, but if we are specifically talking about indigenous population, for example, in India, those would be tribal people, um, their representation in education overall is quite low. Uh, whoever, but if there are students who are coming from indigenous population, they are being included uh, as much as possible in our interviews. Yeah, I have no much to say. Yeah, as Ravani, um, I think you covered everything regarding the, the the location of these students. Or in in India, we see more migration from the rural area to the urban areas in order to enroll in these studies. Whilst in Mexico, um, the population is basically urban and and don't move a, a lot. To enroll in these studies, they tend to study where they live and their families live. So these are basically the differences. But in terms of socioeconomic background, um, in both countries, the 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 most of the students are from low socioeconomic socioeconomic background. Okay, thank you, um, Judith and Srabani, for answering that question. Um, Oscar, we're going to move on to you. Question for you. Someone actually asks, like, if you look through your um, your seven key points um, that you had, and um, the person refers to the second one, although you might have to remind me what exactly that was, but um, does it actually mean that some lifelong learning policies are somehow trying to blame the individual, and that it's it's you know lifelong learning policies try to blame the individual for their own individual deficiencies instead of focusing and trying to tackle some of the more structural deficiencies in society. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's straight to the point, uh, the comment from the, from the uh, audience. Um, I, I was trying to think of an example. I remember uh, um, in, here in Scotland, we are very good at creating policy discourse and policy documents and new, initi and new government initiatives. And, and you can see that in the newspaper. Uh, uh, but when you read these documents, I remember one of them from the Scottish government saying, well, there are two main causes of, of this problematic. There is one group of students that they, uh, or young people that they are in, uh, struggling with employment because of the context of crisis. And this will go uh, when the macroeconomic context changes. So we need to do something with them in the meantime. And there is another group that are the socially excluded in our society that, that we always had them. And then you say, well, as an assessment, it's, 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 quite, <laughs> it's, it's quite a smart one. And then you move to the policy solutions and then develop employ employable skills. So there is a mismatch here between the diagnostic and the solution. And, and yeah, and it's basically, we recognize that there is this problem. We are not going to do anything about it and we pass the responsibility to you. Is what they, what they have been doing, yeah. Okay, thank you for answering that, Oscar. Um, Catherine, I'm gonna come back to you. Um, there, there is a comment um, about an email that went round within the University of Glasgow this morning which is actually about um, an email that our vice chancellor, um, Anton Muscatelli, sent around about the university's position 
with regards towards eliminating structural racism, harassment and discrimination within the university. I don't know whether you've seen the email. I actually um, honestly didn't have time to read the email in detail, but you know, that's the broad topic of the email. So the question is actually, do you see some elements of your project that could potentially feed into some future uh, institutional decisions and actions that we have to make as a university community in this area? Yes, I thought that was a great question and I, I couldn't see the name because it said anonymous, um, but it, it really is a topical issue, especially during COVID where Katie rightly says it offers us the opportunity to change, but unfortunately in times of high cognitive load, we do often revert to stereotypes and learned ways of working. And so it is worrying um, that when we point out um, inequalities, often the knee jerk reaction of institutions is to deny them. So it's quite pleasing that Anton came out with that statement and also what we've done in terms of acknowledging slavery and so on. And yet with our nature index piece, we uh, provide 14 things that could fix the uh, increasing gendered inequality, say in funding, in emergency COVID funding, or in being able to publish now for, for women who are at home caring, because we did an online survey which showed that women even more so than their male colleagues who are at home with children are disproportionately impacted with time uh, for, for writing, with time with getting funding bids in. And when we point these things out, unfortunately, the initial reaction we've had, and again, I'm not gonna name any names, but uh, the initial reaction from the very first person who read the Nature Index came back with what was wrong with it and why they couldn't do what we suggested. And it's always disappointing. But I think as Katie rightly po points out in our chat box, often we see the solutions to uh, racism, to discrimination, to inequalities, to invest at the individual on the individual level, because it's much harder to shift some of the structural things that are going on. I'm quite pleased by um, the university putting out the um, differential impact of COVID funding. So people who can, can apply and make their argument for how they're negatively impacted now. I'm, I'm equating, you know, racial discrimination, gender discrimination, um, but actually, what we're seeing in, in our COVID work is that there's overlapping inequalities of, of marginalized and underrepresented uh, academics being disproportionately affected, especially in STEM subjects where being physically present in a lab is so needed. And so also researchers with disabilities and we've written quite a bit about people on precarious contracts and what an unfortunate position they're in. So again, yes, with, with, with all inequalities, COVID offers us a very real risk and we can see things backsliding and going in a negative direction, but we also see these um, institutional policies that are now coming out to directly tackle inequality. So hopefully Anton's message is part of that. Hopefully there is action behind the words. Um, and likewise with gendered inequalities um, and persons with uh, physical and mental health conditions and caring responsibilities. I would like to see more of that. Okay, thank you, Catherine, for your extensive um, answer on that. Um, Srabani, I'm, I'm going to come back to you. Um, so there is basically a question that says like, okay, you're, you're carrying out this project in India and Mexico. Can you say something about the challenges of policy borrowing? And maybe also something about the interaction between, on the one hand, we have global education policies and targets, um, although it's not specifically mentioned in the question, but I think about something like the sustainable development goals, for example. And then of course you have national policies and local realities at state and city level in, for example, um, India and Mexico. So can you say something about the, the different kind of levels that you're working in? Does that create some kind of tensions or challenges for coming up with conclusions and con coming up with recommendations for policy bor borrowing and policy learning um, between the different settings that you're working in? Sure, uh, Ellen. Um, that seems like almost our whole project. 
Uh, but um, I'll try to try to and maybe maybe cite a couple of examples. Um, there are several challenges. Uh, so so just let me be, be very quick about the method. Quickly say a little bit about the method methodology of this project. With the project is divided into four work packages, and two of them work, which was uh, one one work uh, work package two, which was focused mainly on trying to understand that how the uh, policy adopters, especially at the national level in the two countries, India and Mexico, how they have adopted the, the policy, what, what were some of the logic behind the adoption of this particular Germanic model, and then, you know, then what are some of the challenges in terms of recontextualizing that policy in the, in, 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 in the two countries. And then we had another work package, which was work package three, which is currently ongoing, where we we are trying to interview uh, the implementers of the project and trying to understand uh, of the uh, you know uh, of the policy and trying to understand what are some of the challenges in the implementation of of the of this particular policy. So, for example, implementers in the sense like you know. Uh, uh, vocational institutions, teachers, principals, trainers, uh, employers, um, and of course, students as well. Now, there are, as I said, there are several challenges and, and you know, recontextualizing a policy from, from and a policy that's been developed in the context of the global north, and then having, trying to, you know, um, sort of adopt that and implement that in very completely different context is quite challenging. Now, in one thing, we one challenge that came up at the very beginning was how this whole but this whole policy was uh, adopted in the two countries. So, for example, uh, in India, uh, the the in, the adoption was very much top down. So it it was it came down from the national government. So the national government, the current national government, adopted the policy, um, tried to you know sort of uh, suit it to the current local realities and then insisted that all the vocational institutions um, across the country uh, try to adopt this particular uh, you know uh, model in mexico however the situation was slightly different in mexico uh, the chamber was quite um, you know um, upfront in in promoting the policy and uh, one of the things that we have noted is that whereas in the German model, there is then this very much you know, strong collaboration between social actors, employers, and the training uh, providers, in India, that kind of strong collaboration is pretty much um, you know, uh, not uh, present at all. So for example, uh, like Soma was saying earlier, there was no um, you know, involvement of chamber when the policy was adopted. There was a very less consultation with employers. Um, we, we interviewed, Oscar and I, we interviewed the members of trade unions and you know, they had uh, several issues about why this policy was adopted and how this policy in a way might be sort of you know, um, reinforcing inequalities, especially for young people because uh, people who were being trained under this policy um, were not being called apprentices, but trainees, and then not being provided the kind of social security they should have got if they were you know, inducted into the policy and into the program as apprentices. Now, in the context of Mexico, and, and Judith probably would be able to add more to the Mexican context than me, uh, but in the context, in, in Mexico, at least to some extent, there was a bit more collaboration between the social actors and the employers in terms of how and why this policy needs to be adopted. Uh, Judith, do you want to add anything at this point about the Mexican context? Yeah, more than more than for the specific context, I think that is interesting to highlight that that what we address in this working package are the, the different reasons that the actors uh, have to promote uh, one solution or another solution to one detected problem. In this case, they problematize the situation in some way. Uh, skills meet mismatch or youth unemployment or precarity or marginality and this construction of the problem of the very problem which is slightly different in the two countries um, helps also to explain why uh, different actors address different solutions to these pro problems and what, what we can what we can say is that there are many reasons 
related to the path dependency of each country, uh, of the particular political orientation of the government in the moment which the policy is adopted, um, the, the weight of the different actors, for example, chambers of commerce, or in the case of Mexico, the German chamber of commerce, uh, the, the, the chamber of common, commerce uh, um, outseas of, the, of Germany, I don't know how to say it, um, different uh, actors involved in the promotion of the, of the policy that results in a very different strategies to retain this policy in the end. And for example, in, in India, it depends on one statement of the state, while in Mexico depends on another. Uh, and these impacts also in the implementation of the, of the policy and relating to the question uh, that, that uh, was placed at the beginning, um, saying if we took into account different cultural and social elements of the countries in order to explain this process. Yes, of course, it's uh, super relevant to take into account all these institutional, but also um, global agenda on skills and on lifelong learning policies and so on to explain why and how the, the policies are adopted in the different contexts. And, and just to add to, um, um, to what Ellen, you were asking about the lo local uh, context, one of the issues, for example, we have noted in India is that the vocational institutions, um, you know, um, they, they do not have the kind of infrastructure that is required to adopt a model like this. And therefore, um, although, you know, this instruction sort of have have been almost imposed on the vocational institutions to adopt this particular policy, although it's still voluntary, but a number of uh, vocational institutions across the country are being, you know, um, asked to, to, to uh, you know, adopt this and implement this policy more and more. But the institutions do not have the kind of resources and infrastructure that is required. And especially now that with the COVID situation getting worse and worse uh, in, in, in India, we have seen that how young people um, have not been able to get any kind of training, uh, workplace-based training, because of the fact that not only the institutions are closed, but the workplaces are not able to provide the required training. And therefore, a number of students are being moved from dual apprenticeship to regular apprenticeship training so that they do not have to go through the workplace-based uh, learning and and that is you know that is that we can understand that how detrimental that can be for the career for many of these young people so i guess there are lots and lots of you know challenges at the national level at the local level and uh, you know uh, it's it's really important why then this project is you know so crucial because it sheds light on various challenges that um, actors and implementers experience in adopting a particular policy Soma, would you like to add anything to what we just said? Your, your, your um, microphone, oh, yeah, okay, your microphone is on now. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, but like that's very, you know, the Shabuni, what Shabuni has mentioned. Uh, like, uh, you know, we really don't have the infrastructure, despite the two problems are there. One, what Srabani has mentioned, that we truly do not have the infrastructure. Secondly, as this comes under education, and education is very much part of, you know, the state government's policies. Srabani has also mentioned that despite the central government, you know, wants to implement this, no, all the states are not ready to accept that, to implement that, to bring that in their policies. So that is another impediment which is actually stopping, actually, uh, you know, building a big problem in implementing BSK in India, I mean to say across India. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um... Yeah, maybe I, I, I kind of wondered, Katie, do you still want to um, make an additional comment on top of the answers that you've already heard so far? I wouldn't say I have anything too specific to add. Um, I've just been observing the sort of 
th there's a really consistent approach here that I'm appreciating and, and appreciation for the structural challenges um, um, across the different presentations. And I think it's really great to see that emphasis um, on, on trying to address these structural barriers rather than talking about issues with individual people. So thank you and uh, okay. for inviting me. Okay, thank you. We had um, a couple of uh, questions from, from the Q&A now. So um, before we're going to wrap up, I want to give um, the word to my colleague, Professor Mike Osborne, who is actually going to do a kind of final reflection on uh, the webinar and come up with some key points of what we have, we've all heard um, during the past one hour and 20 minutes. So Mike, over to you. Thanks, Alan. It's been a fascinating set of presentations and, and thank, thanks to all of you. Uh, only a few reflections uh, just at this point because you've had such a, a rich discussion. I, I learned from Catherine's presentation and, 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 and Katie's response quite a lot about your EPSRC project, which I was aware of, but I didn't know the details. And so I suppose what was most shocking to me was um, were some of the comments about uh, the, the hidden uh, challenges uh, that women face in their academic lives, <clears throat> um, which I, which I hadn't quite realised were 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 ha as extreme as they are, <clears throat> and and certainly that's something that must be addressed, and, I, and I'm sure you're you're trying to do that. the the the, the obvious thing that that comes out is is the importance of of networking, and um, I think in academia. We really don't put enough emphasis on that. And we don't really put enough emphasis on uh, the dirty word, I think, uh, of entrepreneurship. Um, su successful people in most professions do have the characteristics of entrepreneurs, not necessarily in the sense of making money, uh, but in the sense of, of social entrepreneurship. And, and some of the things that you were talking about <clears throat> really would fit into any analysis of what makes uh, a successful social entrepreneur or a successful academic entrepreneur. And uh, I think the one thing that perhaps people really need to learn is, is, is not only the networking, but capitalizing on, on that network. And I suppose anybody who knows me well will know that uh, I tend to do that and look, look for opportunity, I suppose, in, in, in situations in, in the best sense of the word. And, and, and realize that you have to be self-motivated as well as, as having the opportunity in your hands. So the, the opportunity can occur, but if you don't have motivation, if you don't spot what that opportunity will lead to, it, it, it won't get you anywhere. And that applies to everybody. But I recognize that there are particular barriers that women uh, face. In terms of the other two presentations, I've been around long enough to know that these issues, many of the issues that came up are ones that have been around for a very long time. And I sent a, a, a note to Oscar after his presentation telling him that only today I learned that um, there's a new lifelong education commission that's been set up in England. And if you look at the questions that that commission is posing, they're very familiar and they're the similar types of things that that Oscar has been talking about and they're similar things that we've tried to address uh, over over the years the the lack of engagement of employers in learning uh, the, the and that particularly is the case with smaller employers I think from projects that I've been involved in in the past because they don't really see what's in it for them uh, to make that investment and how we can overcome that remains a challenge and it's a question that's still still being posed and yet from what uh, Shabani was talking about employers say there's a mismatch between uh, what you're providing for us in education and, and what we need and yet employers don't seem to be willing to make the investment to make sure that that mismatch is is overcome so after almost uh, four decades I suppose working uh, in in lifelong learning um, I see the same questions around. I see the questions which have been posed in inquiries into lifelong learning over a long period of time uh, still there. In fact, I'm currently looking myself at work we did when I had an 
earlier manifestation, which some of you were involved in as the director of the Centre of Research in Lifelong Learning when I worked at the University of Stirling. And only recently, I was looking at the questions we posed about lifelong learning 25 years ago, and they're still valid. Uh, so you'll see some stuff about that coming from me uh, in due course. Um, but just to, just to finally say, um, thank you all of you who've made presentations and thank you to the people who've responded. You're doing really excellent work and I hope that all of you who are listening will have appreciated uh, the inputs today. And back to you, Ellen. Okay, thank you, Mike. Yeah, great comments. And uh, yeah, I could hear your frustrations about how, how, uh, how difficult it is to change things. Um, that's definitely like, I think, uh, quite a lot of our um, experiences as well. So um, it, it's actually time to start wrapping up. So um, it was a pleasure to share this um, session of today. So I really like to thank our speakers. So thanks to Catherine, Srabani, Judith and Oscar. Um, thanks for Katie and uh, Soma to take the time to um, act like uh, like our panelists for our panelists, um, and also thanks to to Muir and Sergio for you know working behind the scenes to uh, make this happening, and thanks to Mike as well for you know initiating the the webinar series and come up with with the kind of final words of today. So. Um, to all the participants, thanks uh, thanks for all the interesting, challenging questions that you asked us. And uh, yeah, keep an eye on the webinar series. We, we have two more to go. So if you're interested in the, in the topics um, of the next sessions, we, we hope to see you there as well. So this is it for today. Thank you very much and uh, see you next time.